I woke up in the middle of the night and realized my husband Roman hadn't come home yet. I noticed his shoes were missing by the front door as I walked to the kitchen for a glass of water. There was no sign of him being home in any of the other rooms. I clenched my fists and let out a deep sigh. Tomorrow, I'm filing for divorce. Where did it all go wrong? Once you start thinking about it, it feels like everything went wrong. Growing up happy without much struggle, landing a job without giving it much thought, marrying my husband, it all seems wrong now. He was my supervisor when I joined the company fresh out of college. I was pretty bad at my job. I couldn't do most of the tasks that my peers did effortlessly. Tagged as a useless newbie, I often stayed late working by myself. The only person who was kind to me was my then boss, my now husband. He patiently taught me the jobs, even staying late with me. I started to fall for his quiet yet earnest nature. Each word from his reserved self became precious to me, and I confessed my feelings passionately. He was a bit confused by my confession, given our age gap, but ultimately said, Sure, let's give it a try. As we sat on a park bench sipping canned coffee after work, my parents were against our marriage. You're not ready for marriage, they said. I ran away from home. I couldn't bear being told I was a failure by even my own parents. After marriage, I became a stay-at-home mom, and for a while, we had peaceful and fulfilling days. But everything changed when our daughter, Emily, was born. Life got chaotic fast. My relationship with my parents was severed, and my in-laws lived far away. With no one to rely on, I hustled to raise the child alone. Once Emily joined kindergarten, I took up a part-time job. Extracurricular activities and private schooling cost money. I wanted to do everything possible so Emily wouldn't struggle in the future. But with housework, childcare, and my part-time job, I started to lose my patience with my unresponsive husband and rebellious daughter. I've been a bad wife and a turbo mom. Was that my mistake? One morning, I was heading to the kitchen to prepare breakfast when I saw my husband by the door. Going somewhere? It was unusual for him to leave early in the morning. Startled, he replied, just for a bit. And he left the house saying, see you. I thought it was odd, but then it started to become a regular thing for him to leave early on weekends. After that, he began to spend a lot of time on his cell phone. Roman has never been the type to be glued to his phone. In fact, he often leaves his personal cell at home and only really uses his work phone. It was strange because now he is glued to his phone for most of the day. Curious, I asked him about it, but his answer was always vague. Then one day, I got invited to a friend's house. Although reluctant, I went because it would help Emily's friendships at my friend's well-kept, stylish home. I mostly zoned out during their elegant conversations until the word affair caught my attention. What? I blurted out. My friend started to share the story of how another mom, Michelle from the next door, found out her husband was cheating. According to her, her husband suddenly started going out on his days off and would only give vague answers when questioned. He'd become absent-minded when spoken to and seemed to be staring at his smartphone all day. Suspicious, Michelle's mom snooped through her husband's phone and found evidence of an affair. She found things like movie tickets he'd gone to with his mistress and receipts from various places. She said, laughing. Listening to their conversation, all I could think about was my own husband's recent behavior. Suddenly, my husband's recent behavior clicked into place. Cheating? Roman, whose only redeeming qualities are that he's quiet and serious? I couldn't believe it but then, I remembered. When we worked together, he was quite popular among the female staff. Feeling dizzy recalling how often he stared at his smartphone, I finished my lukewarmy to calm myself. Could he really be cheating on me? The more I thought about it, the more suspicious everything seemed and an awkward tension began to build up between us. The tension, coupled with my own stress, made me increasingly irritable, and I started to lash out at both my husband and our daughter, Emily. One day, Roman claimed that he wanted to get divorced. Divorce? Unable to believe it, I sat there dumbfounded while he muttered, I'm sorry. Why? Why now? In response to my question, he just stared at the table and repeated, I'm sorry. I asked why. I said, growing increasingly frustrated. I've been thinking. He replied. About what? Unable to contain my anger any longer, I raised my voice. He looked down. You're cheating, aren't you? He looked up, 
his eyes wide open. Why? He whispered, and he was visibly shaken, feeling my hands tremble with rage. I said, I knew it. He just stared back at me, not saying a word, not even going to make an excuse. Is talking to me really that much of a burden? Fine. Let's divorce. I said as I stood up, leaving him behind and headed to my room. Emily, you're going to be Emily Johnson from now on, and we'll live just the two of us. No matter how many times I told her, Emily, of course, couldn't understand and started crying. No, I want both mommy and daddy. Should I reconsider the divorce for Emily's sake? Should we talk about it again? These thoughts crossed my mind when our eyes met. My husband looked away, and anger welled up inside me. When should we file the divorce? Before I knew it, those words had slipped out of my mouth. Right. He mumbled. It's the same whenever we do it. I'm off from my part-time job tomorrow, so I'll take care of it then. I said, letting my anger speak for me. Okay. Was all he said before leaving the house without eating breakfast. Is daddy home yet? Emily stared resentfully at her cold hamburger. It was already past 9 p.m. and my husband hadn't returned. He had often worked late, so it wasn't entirely unusual, but still. I told Emily to eat and go to bed, but she stubbornly refused. She glared at her hamburger, on the verge of tears. Ever since the talk about divorce, she had insisted on waiting for her father to return. Eventually, she fell asleep, and I wrapped up her small hamburger and put it in the fridge. I then carried her to her room. He should at least come home early today. I voiced my complaints about my absent husband, unable to wait for him alone. I got ready for bed and fell asleep next to Emily. Maybe it was because I went to bed early, but I woke up in the middle of the night and went to the kitchen for some water. On the way there, I noticed my husband still hadn't come home. No shoes at the entrance and no signs of his return in the other rooms. The wall clock read 1 a.m. He couldn't possibly be working this late. His office is near our home in the suburbs, and he's not one to stay out drinking late. Could he be with a mistress now that we're getting a divorce? I felt an overwhelming mix of sadness and anger. I'll catch him cheating and expose him. This thought crossed my mind because of conversations I had with my mom friends. They said they found plenty of evidence like movie tickets when they searched rooms. I'll confront him with the evidence and take him for all he's worth. Fired up, I entered his room. His room was originally his study, but at some point, he started sleeping there regularly. I rarely ever entered this room, so stepping in now felt oddly guilty. The room, which belonged to my husband, was meticulously organized and seemed as if time had stood still since I last entered it. As I looked around, I noticed an envelope on his desk. Curiosity got the best of me, so I picked it up. Should I be reading this? But then again, it could be proof of his infidelity. I took the plunge and opened it. What is this? I gasped involuntarily. Inside wasn't evidence of an affair but rather medical records. My hand trembled as I read the diagnosis. I felt dizzy and had to lean on the desk. A notebook fell to the floor with a thud. Snapping back to reality, I picked it up. In neat handwriting, it was filled with something. My eyes caught my name, Jessica. My husband's neat handwriting. I couldn't help but read through the pages filled with my husband's neat handwriting. It was his diary, dated from about a month ago. It read, Jessica caught my attention today before I went to the hospital. Didn't know what to say, so I dodged the question. I feel terrible. If I want to cure my illness, it looks like I'll need to be hospitalized. What will happen to Jessica and Emily? Told a co-worker about my illness. She's close to Jessica and said she would help her find a job if needed. Can't get used to smartphones though. Met with Jessica's parents today. They said they would be there for her. Glad I kept in touch. After thinking it through, I can't be a burden on Jessica and Emily. When I told her about getting divorced she asked if I was cheating. I've been causing her unnecessary stress. But if she can be happy without feeling guilty, that's the best. There, in his neat handwriting, was the raw, clumsy emotion of my husband. The notebook was mostly filled with concerns about me and our daughter, Emily. I understood just how seriously he had been taking every little conversation we had. On the bookshelf, I found several more notebooks just like it. After quickly flipping through them, I ran out of the house. I searched the nighttime streets for my husband. Where could he be? I had no idea where to look for him. And that realization hit me hard. A place where he is likely to be. His favorite place. 
Suddenly, I knew where to go. When I got there, he was sitting on a bench with a canned coffee in his hand. I sit down next to my husband, canned coffee in hand. He looks at me with surprise and says, Why? I came to pick you up because it's getting late. At that, he replies, I'm sorry. I glare at him and say, Sorry doesn't cut it. Why didn't you tell me anything? I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know. I can't read between the lines. If you have time to jot down your thoughts and have a little solo reflection, then you have time to tell me. I couldn't finish my sentence. I'm overwhelmed with tears and sobs. I didn't mean to say all that. I'm really a terrible person. I managed to say, I'm sorry. I've been so self-absorbed. I only cared about how others saw me and didn't notice your struggles. I thought I was the only one suffering. He interrupts. I love this part. I'm startled by his interruption. He doesn't continue and just stares at his coffee. When we decided to build a house near my office, you were opposed. But I discovered many of your good qualities in this park. I love the time spent here with you, drinking can coffee after work. You were always so focused and dedicated to what was in front of you, and that brought strength to me. It made me wanting to protect you. That hasn't changed. Then he hands me a handkerchief. I didn't want to burden you. You're young and attractive. You can start over. Wiping my tears with the handkerchief he handed me, I grip it tightly. This was the type of handkerchief my husband had started buying after I kept forgetting to iron his. I thought he was making a statement, but now I understand. It was your way of being considerate. I press the cold can coffee against the nape of his neck. He jumps back with wide eyes at the sudden cold sensation and I burst into laughter. Do you really see me? I'm such a mess. Do you really think anyone else would want to be with me? I grasp the can in his hand with both of mine. Please let me stay by your side. Give me a chance to start over. Let me support you. He looks into my eyes and simply says, I'm counting on you. Later, we sit down to explain to our young daughter, Emily, about her father's illness. She might not fully understand, but she promises to do her best as well. To focus on his treatment, my husband was hospitalized, and I ended up going back to work. Thanks to my husband's preparations, I was able to return to work as a full-time employee. While I'm at work, my parents look after Emily. My parents adore their granddaughter and take good care of her. At first, they made snide comments, but when I apologized, they hugged me and acknowledged that I was doing my best too. Despite my tendency to be overwhelmed and make mistakes, my husband keeps supporting me with his warm smile. I now realize he is a man rich in expression, conveying all his feelings with just a look. I learn to appreciate the small gestures and unspoken signals. When he's troubled, he scratches behind his ears. When he's happy, he wipes his nose. When he laughs, he squints his eyes gently. I was reminded once again that there are many things that can be conveyed without words. Soon, he'll be switching to home-based care, and Emily wipes her nose and laughs. We can all live together again. I notice she has the same habits as her father and hug her tightly. I wonder how much I've missed out on so far. I want to cherish every moment and every gesture with my family until the end.